Welcome to Money Talks. I'm Genevieve Westcott with your latest financial news from across New Zealand and around the globe. In this edition, foreign ownership of farmland remains under the spotlight, with high court challenges of the Overseas Investment Office greenlighting the sale of 16 Crayfar farms to a Chinese company, while U.S. movie director James Cameron gets the OIO nod to buy 1,000 hectares of farmland in the Wairapa. The World Economic Forum has three predictions about the state of play globally that you should know about. And why investing in our agricultural and horticultural companies makes good business sense, according to one of New Zealand's leading players. But first, the latest word on New Zealand's commodity prices, up 1.2% in January, according to the ANZ Commodity Index, for the first time in eight months. But the high Kiwi dollar wiped out the benefits in local currency terms. Cheese prices rose 5% while skim milk powder and butter prices increased 3%. Lamb prices lifted 2%, and beef skins and whole milk powder all had price rises of about 1%. But wool prices fell 7%, now sitting at 19%, below the peak of last July. Meantime, prices of dairy products sold on Fonterra's global dairy trade platform fell this week for the third time in four sales, with declines for all six product types on offer. And agricultural sector debt fell $26 million in December, to 47,332 million, according to the Reserve Bank. Time now to find out more about a private investment company called Direct Capital that's currently putting its money into agribusiness. Everything from apples, pet food, wool scouring, and freezing works by products to sugar, sheep, and breeding genetics. Joining us now is Direct Capital's founder and managing director, Ross George. Ross, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. How much uh, money is your company currently investing in the agribusiness uh, uh, sector here in New Zealand? We have a, a fund that's currently 325 million, and uh, at the moment, almost half of that is in, in agribusiness. But I should say we can invest in any industry we want to. It's just that we've focused on this uh, over the last five or six years. Let me just reel off some of the companies that you have money in now that mm. you think are good bets. Scales, uh, Apples, mm. of course, Cavalier, mm. Wool Scouring, mm. Bailey's, Farm Sales, mm -hmm. New Zealand King Salmon, mm. New Zealand Pharmaceuticals. Vital Foods, Kiwi Fruit, mm -hmm. uh, Nobolo, uh, P.F. Olsen, Forestry, Horizon, Sugar, fascinating story, and Focus. That's a heck of a lot. Uh, what is it about the agribusiness world that you think makes good economic sense? It's, um, it's probably the food megatrend. We only invest in private companies, so we have to look for long-term megatrends. And food, in our view, is, is one of them. It's been a focus of ours for a very long time. The, um, the food to Asia story is, is a long-term trend. It's one for us, it's one for our children in our view. And, um, and as I say, we just have to look at these 15-year uh, trends and, and follow them. Now, when you do invest, what do you look for uh, precisely? Because I imagine a lot of people would say, look, tough times, a lot of companies in trouble. You'd be picking them off like crazy, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah, OK. No. Um, no. And we only invest in good companies. You know, there's lots of people invest in, in companies that are in trouble and fix them up. And uh, our business is based around finding good industries, which we think agribusiness is, good companies within that sector, and good people. And we put capital into those companies just to accelerate their growth. And, and look, I've got to say, when you have good people and good businesses, when you capitalise those businesses really well, there is a, there is a, that is a great model to make money on for everyone. Now you put money into scales last year. Mm. You took it off uh, after the Alan Hubbard uh, fiasco. Yes. Uh, it's a tough industry. Uh, did you get it cheaply? L look, a lot of people say that, but no, uh, no. I think we bought it. I think we did buy it fairly, and with that, uh, with the transparency in that and uh, that receivership process, about 28 people expressed an interest in it. I think if if, if it was cheap. It's simply because it was a very disparate group of companies. It's, as you say, it's in pet food, it's in apples, and it's in cold, cool and cold stores, logistics. 
and not everyone wanted all three of those. We are a broad investor and we were happy to invest in all three. So look, I think, I think it was a, a good company for us to buy and I think the process was good because the receivers said they didn't want to split it up into three groups. Now you're also into Cavalier uh, mm. and they're about to get a new CEO next month I believe. Uh, what is the attraction with uh, the wool scouring business? Right, well we're in Cavalier Wool Holdings which is a wool scouring business and that's all it does. Um, Cavalier Carpets is a uh, is a carpet manufacturer and, is a, and together with Godfrey Hurst is a very large customer of Cavalier Wool Holdings. The wool industry, like many primary industries, is, sh is short of capital. There are lots of great things that could happen in the wool industry. It's just finding capital to, to make them happen. And, the, and, and it's very hard to get capital into an industry that's declining. And you know, our wool industry has been in long-term decline, but there is an opportunity to, to take some leadership in, wool, in the wool scouring industry and perhaps the wool logistics industry as well. And we think a combination of people and capital will make that happen. You're also involved in a, a new kind of sugar. Tell mm. me about that, which, which is, is, is potentially a, a world first. Yes, we, we invest in Australia and New Zealand. Primary, our, our primary focus is in, is in New Zealand, but this is an Australian business based in, in Queensland. It, it uses the waste or the bagasse from, uh, from uh, sugar cane, uh, from sugar refineries. It takes properties out of that and it makes a low GI sugar, meaning sugar that takes longer to be, uh, to be uh, absorbed in the body. And that's obviously good for, uh, for children, you know, they'd stop the sugar hit. Uh, sugar is a very, very large industry. It's good for diabetics. And it, you're right, it is a first, and it is a relatively new company, but it already has 2% of the Australian sugar industry at supermarkets, so it shows lots of promise. And New Zealand King Salmon is another company that you're heavily invested mm. in. Uh, now, we know that uh, towards the end of last year, uh, John Key announced that the whole aquaculture industry in New Zealand is going to get a huge uh, helping hand, if you like, from government. Uh, what, what are the challenges facing this company in particular? Uh, look, it's growth. The, uh, we can sell as much salmon around the world as we can produce. And we, um, you're right, the, the, the law changed and allowed aquaculture companies to grow. And that was badly needed. The, uh, companies such as New Zealand King Salmon wouldn't invest the money on the promise of, a, of growth because there was, no, there was never a shortage, that, there was never a surety that you would get additional water space. That happened at the end of last year. We haven't got the farms approved yet, but we were able to buy two farms off Pacifica. And as I say, New Zealand King Salmon can sell as much salmon around the world as it can produce. We, we export to, we even ex, we export to the US, to Europe, to Asia, and to Australia. And we could allocate an enormous amount more fish to each one of those markets. So it, it, was, it was a great move forward for aquaculture generally and very good for New Zealand King Salmon. Ross, let me ask you this, $64 question. Mm. Why isn't the capital here in New Zealand to invest in, in, in primary industries, particularly food industries? To me, it mm. seems crazy. Yep, it, it, look, it is, but part of, part of food, when you think about it, is being out of the commodity era, area. You, we want to invest in, in food businesses that, that own their, their genetics, own their production, own their processing, own their brand, and own their distribution. If you get caught in one of those parts of the chain, you might find yourself in the commodity pricing area. And I don't think New Zealand food can compete in the commodity area. In fact, I don't think New Zealand primary industries can compete in the commodity area. We have to, we have to sell a New Zealand apple, not an apple. It has to be a dollar ten apple rather than a sixty cent apple competing with other sixty cent apples. So, typically, uh, when you're out looking to get involved in a company, what's your typical company look like? What's what's the profile you target? Uh, it, it's a private company, but there are lots of it. New Zealand, is, New Zealand has private companies in abundance. In fact, we've got very few listed companies. It's a private company with revenues of somewhere between 30 million to 250 million in general terms. And as I say, we started in 1994. We just invest in industries that we think are good, need capital, good businesses within that industry, and with good people. And Look, it's been working since 1994, so we haven't changed that recipe. 
Thanks very much. We'll come back after the break. Coming up, three predictions from the pundits at the recent World Economic Forum. All yours for the asking. And senior financial advisor for Spicer's Jeff Matthews joins us to talk about his take on the current investment climate here at home and abroad. But first, agribusiness mogul Alan Pye and his associates, Colin and Dale Armour, now have full control of New Zealand's biggest dairy farming conglomerate, Dairy Holdings, after South Canterbury Finance sold its stake in the business on Friday. Seems they're now in charge of 58 South Island dairy farms on 18,000 hectares of land with more than 43,000 milking cows. So answer this in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. What's Dairy Holdings worth today? And how much did Alan Pye and his associates pay for a slice of the action? The answer is when we return. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, what's dairy holdings worth today? And how much did Alan Pye and his associates pay for a slice of the action? Well, the dairy company is a $535 million business, with Mr. Pye and Associates paying out $54.4 million for the shares. Joining us now to talk more about the strategies of investment in these turbulent times is Senior Financial Advisor for Spicers, Jeff Matthews. And Jeff, you make a living advising people on uh, where to put their money. What's the uh, current climate like from your point of view? You mean locally or globally? Both. Locally, I mean, I, I guess investors have been risk averse the last couple of years since the 08 crisis. And to some extent, those people who had corporate bonds, you know, were getting seven and a half, eight percent. A lot of those investments are actually starting to mature this year. So a lot of investors are facing, it's a bit like coming off a three or four year term deposit at eight and a half and suddenly the going rate's going to be four and a half. How are they going to live with reduced income? And so the question is, you know, are you prepared to trade off investing in perhaps some good companies um, that pay a higher level of dividends, but the share price fluctuates? That's what clients don't like is the capital value going up and down. Uh, Ross, what's your view on the current uh, investment climate, if you like, in light of the GFC? It's for people like us. It's a good environment. In fact, the most difficult environment we ever we ever encountered was 2005 to 2008, where where it was just so boom, it, nothing could go wrong, and and prices went through the roof, and people leveraged businesses. We only invest equity, so so right now there is a shortage of equity, and I think it's it's a it's a good time for us, and we're actively investing and we're aggressively investing, but that's because we invest on quite long time frames. We don't mind what happens next year. We do mind what happens in the next 10 years. Okay, now Jeff, I know that you follow very closely what's happening in the US of A. Uh, what's the latest there? Well, I mean, it's been a fantastic start to the year. I mean, the markets, are, it's the biggest January gain since uh, 1994. Um, it's probably added about $3 trillion of value to the US stock market. We had good numbers last week. I mean, I know the unemployment numbers can be kind of lies, lies and statistics, but 243,000 non-farm jobs, that's got the unemployment rate down at 8.3. It's probably going to help Obama in the elections later this year. So there's been a number of good news stories that we talked about last year, but because of the political overhang both in the States and in Europe, investment markets were suppressed. And then suddenly they've, you know, they've taken off in January big time. So. And what's happening in China? The central bank uh, raised interest rates. They raised the amount of money that banks have to hold with them on very low, you know, like 20% of the money has to be held with the central bank at, you know, pathetic interest rates. So that kind of took a lot of money out of the, out of the economy. Now they're in a position that inflation is not running at double digits for food. Um, they can then start relaxing a little bit, reducing the amount of money that's held by the central bank because it, economic growth is looking more like eight and a half rather than the kind of nine and a half, ten and a half that we've got used to. China is, is, a, is another long-term mega trend and a positive one. I think China will be successful in anything it sets its mind to. It, it, is, you know, it has got an interesting, an, an interesting sort of centrally led capitalist system going now. It can make changes very quickly. Being such a big China fan, I take it you weren't too upset when the Chinese were allowed to buy those 16 Crafer farms. What's your take on it? My take on it is I don't mind 
us being able to invest offshore and I, and I treasure that right and I don't mind other people investing in New Zealand. Okay, one thing I do want to talk about, gentlemen, are, are three uh, predictions that came out from the economic geniuses that just uh, uh, covered the, uh, or were just attending the, the World Economic Forum. Number one prediction, bottom-up movements will continue to reshape our world. And what they mean by that are the, you know, the, the Occupy movements that we saw around the world here in New Zealand and yep. elsewhere, <coughs> that the people are actually rising up and really changing the way companies, for example, do business. What do you think about that? Oh, I think it's inevitable. I mean, when you look at the growth of things like Facebook and the fact that what happened in um, Tunisia and um, Libya and Egypt started off through those kind of social network, um, it has the ability, I mean, you basically bypass the standard media, you bypass the TV networks, you bypass News Corp, and you go straight to the public. Absolutely, and an amazing power. And we've seen it here, Ross, with uh, how much, for example, CEOs are being paid of, of some of the local governments. Uh, people are mad as hell, and they're saying they're not going to take it anymore. Uh, do we expect to see more of that here in New Zealand? Um, I, I don't really know if we'll see more, but I have no problem with bad business practices being highlighted. I think it's a, I think it's a good thing. Look, investors like us are quite constrained because we've signed up to, the, to these quite strong protocols that the United Nations have set out for fair investing. And, um, and it doesn't mean you're soft, it's actually a good business practice and most of us sell to the communities that we live in and so appealing to the communities you live in is, is a positive business thing and I think it's a positive social thing so I think it's a, I think it's a win win if you're, if you're a good company behaving well. Okay, prediction number two from the geniuses at the World Economic Forum. Europe will struggle mightily in the coming years. In fact, the Eurozone, they're saying, could very well break up. This would be devastating for the global economy, wouldn't it, Jeff? I think the markets have already factored in the fact that places like Greece will probably end up leaving the Euro at some stage. I mean, the Germans don't want it to break up. So they will fund whatever they need to fund um, to keep the thing together. But really, it's still not a solution for Greece. They can't devalue their currency. They can't make themselves competitive. Yeah, they're not doing the, 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 the hard changes that's no. being expected. The next ones are due, what, next month? And March. there's Yeah, there's no way they say that they're going to meet it. But I mean, under a normal situation like that, if you had like a receiver comes in, the receiver takes over and makes the tough decisions. But I mean, you're talking about individual governments. I mean, no one's going to want a whole bunch of Germans or French people coming in saying, right, you know, all you school teachers, all you firemen, um, you're gone. I mean, <laughs> in a perfect world, you know, that might work and maybe that's what they need. Um, but, you know, Right now, they're still negotiating with the three different Greek, Greece, Greek political parties, and, and yeah. Yeah, yeah, politics comes into it. You're going to love this one. Prediction number three: Asia is going to have a great year. Asia is going to have a great several decades. Mm. Europe is in trouble, and Europe is, has very few mechanisms to allow it to get out of trouble. The U.S. is fantastic at reinventing itself, but we are lucky. We've already got inroads into Asia, and Asia is a great 50-year trend. Yeah, and India as well. Uh, they're picking 7 to 8% growth there yep. as well, so that's yep. uh, that's win-win, yep. hopefully for New Zealand. Exactly. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Coming up after the break, future proof on the highways and byways of the economic world as our experts point out what's coming up. But first, Indonesians have taken a stake in Southland's Blue River Dairy Products, a sheep milking business which controls about 50 1,500 hectares of land near Invercargill. So answer this in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. How much of the company did the Indonesians buy? Find out after the break. Come back quick. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, how much of Blue River Dairy products did the Indonesians buy? They bought 50% of the business, providing new capital to get the company into Southeast Asia by commercializing its sheep milking systems and technology. And now it's time for Future Proof. What's coming up for our experts? You started out life as a shearer. <laughs> and you know about Blue River. Tell us more. Have you ever milked a sheep? No, I haven't milked a sheep. But well, I have, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> but I have been to Blue River, and that is a fantastic operation. Tell and me it, about it. Tell me about it. Look, visually it's very interesting. And, and look, it is interesting because uh, sheep 
and goat uh, milk is a big part of, of the world dairy industry and we forget about that because of our own eating habits. But it is a, uh, look, it would be very good TV, the sheep run in, they get fed in, the, in their milking bays and it happens in a jiffy and, uh, and it's a very slick operation. All right, good to know. Yes. Now, I know that you are a huge polo fan. Jeff, <laughs> you ever played polo? No, I haven't. Any desire to play polo? No, I can't Would... ride a horse. So. Oh, oh, well, that, yeah, that could be an impediment. Well, this guy does play polo. <laughs> Tell me about that, because polo, the big match is coming up. Yes, well, look, hey, look polo is actually also a big business, and uh, it's a big business for sponsors, but it's a big business cause, because New Zealand has very good thoroughbred ponies. They, they're very famous on the race course, but in fact a lot of, a lot of the world's polo ponies come from New Zealand, and, and most world polo tournaments have got New Zealand horses competing in them. So, so it is a business, it's a sport, I'm, uh, I'm an amateur, I have a day job, but there are a lot of people who are professional polo players as well, and, and look, I grew up with horses, and, uh, and when I finished rugby I was looking for a team sport, and I I must say, I just, I, I, uh, I love it, and it's a, it's a big passion over the summer for me. And one of the companies you invest in, Rod and Gun, is mm. a big uh, sponsor. How much of a commitment do they make uh, to Polo? Yeah, well, that, look, they, they, they are quite big in the equine industries generally in Australia and New Zealand. They're, they're present at big race days in Australia. They're present at, at Ellerslie, and they've, and they've sponsored the Rod and Gun team for four years now, and. Uh, like all sports Despite teams. Despite your performance, they're still <laughs> sponsoring them. This is, a, a, this is a team with pink jerseys. Yeah, it okay, is, there you right. go. Say no more. Look, it's, <laughs> as long as you keep winning, you can keep a sponsor. That's what we've yeah. learned. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, excellent. Even if you have to bribe the judges. That's great. <clears throat> yeah. Now, Jeff, what are you going to be watching over the next seven days? Well, I don't look at stuff on a seven, 14-day cycle. I'm looking at it longer term. And we have touched on it in the past from an ag sector. It was an interesting article yesterday about the big increase in farm in, in farm numbers for soya bean, wheat, and corn in the US. Um, because of record commodity prices, the US are looking to plant 227 million acres of corn, soya bean, and wheat. That's about a 2.5% increase on last year. To put that in context, that's about the size of the state of New Jersey going into additional production. Unbelievable. What it did, it, you know, uh, it added something like 28% to farm incomes last year. So record high. US is a fantastic producer, as is Canada, on those kind of items. So, you know, big production numbers. So I guess the commodity prices will be coming off because there'll be so much more stuff coming on stream. Ross, let me ask you, what kind of an investment year are you picking for Kiwis? This year, 2012. Kiwis in New Zealand. In New Zealand. Yes. Uh, look, it's very hard. It's very hard in our environment because you're always seeing companies that are doing something, and so we see we see the most optimistic uh, New Zealanders. I um I think it's a flat to falling macro environment, but I think there are a lot of things individual companies can do that will push them ahead and. As I say, we see a small portion of it because that's, they tend to be the companies that we invest in. Now, interesting, I, I know that Jeff and I, we've talked on previous shows about the aging demographics of mm -hmm. New right. Zealand. Yes. And certainly when it comes to private companies, yeah. uh, they're being run by uh, older white men, uh, largely in New Zealand. How is that going to change things for you, do you think? Yeah, look, all, all three of those are, are correct at the moment, actually. Uh, we have an older ownership structure in our private company market than any other country we can find and it's quite you know it's quite markedly older so there aren't trade buyers to buy all of these companies off of generally 60 to 70 year old people that are looking to sell and uh, so uh, interesting enough we have a, a whole new area of business has grown up for us of buying businesses off older owners with the younger managers who are generally somewhere between 35 and 50 and we um, and, and it's, a big, it's a, big, a big business area. And it rejuvenates a company as well. It's good for a company. Jeff, do you think that the aging demographics are going to change the way people invest in New Zealand? Uh, what's your call? The problem in New Zealand is investors have been rewarded disproportionately for taking no risk.
So by buying you know, government bonds or putting money in term deposits, they've been getting abnormally higher returns where they should have been investing in New Zealand companies. But because of what happened 25 years ago, there's a whole generation of investors. But the moment you mention shares, even good companies, um, they're, 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 um, they glaze over. Yeah, they're conservative. They don't want so to So they'd do rather it. put money in finance companies and lose the money that way. All right. Next show, we'll talk about how we can fix that. Promise. Yeah. Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks to my guest, Senior Financial Advisor for Spicers, Jeff Matthews, and Managing Director of Direct Capital, Ross George. Be sure to check out our website. Meantime, are you tired of all those Christmas bills flooding in? Wondering how best to deal with them? Well, if you've got a baby in the house, you might want to consider this approach. <gasps> <laughs> Keep the faith. See you next time.